warm greetings to all. Welcome again and I hope everyone is doing well. I, Dr. Shikha Dhaman, Assistant Professor, Department of Laws, Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, is again in front of you to present a lecture on the topic, Critical Appraisal of the Scheme of 1793 and the Progress of Adalat System under Sir John Shore. Let's begin with the introduction. The transition from justice dictated by an individual discretion to that governed by the rule of law was the revolutionary achievement of British Indian administration. Until 1793, the judicial policy of the government of company in Bengal was guided by traditions and old customs. The tradition was that of the Mughal rule which entrusted the management of civil justice to those in charge of collection of revenue of the expediency that of discharging the obligation of Diwani with as little spending from the profit as possible. The actual operation of judicial plan under Cornwallis Code of 1793 showed that the scheme was wise but it created a serious problem of large areas of cases awaiting disposal in the courts. Unfortunately, Lord Cornwallis did not stay in India to see the consequences of his judicial reforms which he had introduced in 1793. The Legacy of Sir John Shore Sir John Shore as Governor General always avoided any sort of war as well as confrontation. His aim and policy was to consolidate and administer the colonial state very well without indulging into any unnecessary foreign adventure and tasks. During his presidency rule, there remained peace and order for a tenure of five years. Sir John Shore was specially well known for his unwavering honesty every time when the company officers were generally the corrupted one. Also, making a quick buck by robbing the subject people became the norm among executive of the company. Hence, it can also be said that Sir John Shore was an outlier. Therefore, now let's talk about the scheme of the plan of 1793. The judicial plan of 1793 aimed to remove the drawbacks existing in the administration of the civil justice system. It suffered a significant setback because of the over-centralization of powers in a single authority of the collector in every district. The vesting of judicial and revenue administration in the same person, that is the collector of the district, leads to miscarriage of justice and abuse of power. The said collector also acted as the magistrate for criminal adjudication under the plan of 1787. It was experienced that the collectors considered their revenue collection as their primary function and the administration of civil justice as their secondary function. The reason behind the discrimination was that the collectors used to get an extra commission on the amount of revenue collected by them. It adversely affected the efficacy of judicial administration. Therefore, in order to remove the shortcomings of the plan of 1787, Lord Cornwallis introduced various changes in the administration of civil justice through his judicial plan of 1793. He brought into force a code which was named as Cornwallis Code which comprised of 48 regulations. The reforms were aimed to bring the separation of executive from the judiciary and the exercise of judicial control on the actions taken by the government. The significant attributes of the code are just discussed now. Number one, separation of civil and revenue jurisdiction. From the experience of vesting of the revenue and judicial functions in the collector, Cornwallis observed that in the interest of justice, it was imperative to restore to the separation of the judicial and revenue functions. Accordingly, the judicial plan of 1793 reformed the role played by the collector. Now, he was required to collect only the revenue 
and his other powers like the power to decide revenue, civil cases, etc. were all taken away and vested in the Mufassil Diwani Adalats. The concept of Mal Adalats was also established and the collector was now supposed to collect the revenue under the supervision of Board of Revenue, which was further governed by Governor General and the Council at Calcutta. The civil and the revenue cases were now to be tried by the Mufassil Diwani Adalats. An appeal from the revenue cases decided by the Mufassil Diwani Adalat was to be preferred to the Board of Revenue and a second appeal could be filed to the Governor General and the Council. Now, there was a reorganization of the concept of Diwani Adalat. Regulation 3 of the Code aimed to make the functioning of the civil courts independent and efficient. Resultantly, the Mufassil Diwani Adalats were established in every district of the states, namely Bengal, Bihar and Odisha. The collector was replaced by a civil servant of the company and the latter was appointed as a judge of the Adalat. The judge of the Diwani Adalat was required to take an oath in the prescribed manner. The proceedings of the court held in the open and the presiding officers were assisted by Hindu and Mohammedan native law officers. The jurisdiction of the court extended to deciding the civil as well as revenue cases. In revenue matters, an appeal from the Mufassil Diwani Adalat was required to be filled to the Board of Revenue and a further appeal from the decision of Mufassil Diwani Adalat could be preferred to the Governor General and the Council at Calcutta. However, in the civil matters, an appeal from the decision of Mufassil Diwani Adalat was filled to the Provisional Court of Appeal in all the cases irrespective of the pecuniary value. The jurisdiction of Mufassil Diwani Adalat was extended to the collector and other executor officers of the government. So, we can say that it was through the judicial plan of 1793, the principle of judicial control over the executive actions of the government was introduced in India for the very first time. Now, let's talk a little about the appeals from the Diwani Adalat. The appeals in all civil cases, irrespective of the value of the subject matter of the case, were to be preferred to the Provisional Court of Appeal. The Provisional Court of Appeals were created in Patna, Calcutta and Murshidabad. It consisted of three English judges of the East India Company and had appellate jurisdiction for the division. But the court was also empowered to decide the cases of civil nature referred to it by the Sadar Diwani Adalat or the company's government. Another point was regarding the court fees and that was abolished. Cornwallis Code also brought another change that is the abolition of court fees. The litigants were now not required to pay any fees excluding the pleader's fee and the expenses incurred for summoning the witnesses. Another thing came was reform in the police system. The judicial plan of 1793 restructured the entire police system of Bengal, Bihar and Odisha and now every district was divided into police jurisdictions of 20 miles each and was guarded by a daraga with an armed constable. There were to be appointed by the magistrates. The cities of Dhaka, Patna and Murshidabad were divided into wards each of which was guarded by the roga under the direct control of the Kotwal. The police officials, namely at the Ruga and Kotwal, were to be apprehend the criminals and prevent the crime. They were also responsible for the maintenance of peace and order within the area under their guard. Another change was regarding the permanent settlement of land revenue. To avoid the uncertainties about the collection of revenue, Cornwallis convinced the directors of the company to do the permanent settlement of land revenues. The zamindars were made the landowner and were also asked to pay nine-tenths of the revenue collection to the government. 
Now, let us talk little about the critical appreciation of the judicial plan of 1793. It was observed that Warren Hastings had assumed full responsibility for the administration of civil justice through his judicial plan of 1772, but he did not introduce any reforms in the criminal justice system. However, the supervisory control over criminal justice was affected in 1781 through the Court of Remembrance, which was continued further by Cornwallis, who followed the footsteps of Hastings and introduced the reforms in the criminal side. Further, through the scheme of 1780, Warren Hastings had tried to segregate the revenue administration from civil jurisdiction, but Cornwallis also adopted the principle of complete separation of executive from the judiciary and also the principle of sovereignty of law in India. Lord Cornwallis, an able and efficient administrator, worked for the eradication of corruption and other malpractices prevalent in the Indian judicial system at that time. He also introduced the judicial reforms at the risk of incurring an extra expenditure to the tune of rupees 4 lakhs for which he had no sanction from the company. He was of the opinion that the people who paid large sums towards revenue payments to the company were at least entitled to be relieved from tyranny and oppression of the law courts and the executive officers of the company. The most significant feature of judicial plan of 1793 was based on the sound principles of checks and balances that was totally distinctly demarcating the powers, jurisdiction and functions of the different categories of the courts. The scheme of 1793 was based on humanitarian considerations of public welfare. Thus, we got the accepted by the masses and its operation extended to Bombay, Madras and Banaras. Later then there was the progress of the Adalat system under the Sir John Shore. Ironically, Lord Cornwallis was unable to witness the outcome of his judicial reforms which he had introduced in 1793 and was succeeded by Sir John Shore, a member of the Indian service as Governor General in 1793. The latter accepted and appreciated the judicial reforms introduced by Lord Cornwallis and considered the separation of executive from judicial functions and the permanent settlement of revenue as the most beneficial for Britishers and the Indian natives. Now, let us discuss some of the reasons as to why there was a need for the introduction of a new plan. The functioning of the judicial plan under Cornwallis depicted that the scheme was unique, but it resulted in the pendency of the cases, which defeated the main purpose of judicial scheme. His motives were laudable, but the weakness of the plan, in fact, that recourse to the courts was wholly ineffective as a means to protect the rights against zamidars. The permanent settlement worked efficiently, litigation choked the courts and the sales of estates became very common. Therefore, many representations were made to the government to mend the matters and also to initiate adequate measures for resolving these difficulties. There were many contributions also that were made by Sir John Shore. Now, what were those? Sir John Shore observed that some immediate measures were necessary to relieve the courts from the burden of pendency of cases. In his opinion, inadequacy of courts, limited powers of registrar and munsifs, and the abolition of court fees were the main causes of overburdening the courts with areas of work. Therefore, he brought changes in the Cornwallis Plan of 1793 in order to remove these defects. He was also of the opinion that mismanagement by zamidars in the collection of land revenue was yet another cause of increase in the volume of litigation in Diwani Adalat. However, 
he was not in favor of simplifying the procedure because it was necessary to follow the forms of procedure for proper administration of justice nor did he favor the idea of increasing the number of courts meant additional burden the government exchequer he declared the in disposal cases past years was only temporary phase during of the scheme cases would expeditiously different tribunals were established started functioning in the full moderate changes introduced earlier cornwallis scheme were now let's talk about some developments that were made in the year 1794 under the judicial plan of 1793 the registrar's court was empowered to decide the cases up to rupees 200 but the decrees passed by them had to be countersigned by the judges of diwan e adalat the process was cumbersome thus sir john shore changed this procedure and empowered the registrar to try and decide cases without any reference to or counter signature of the judge of diwan e adalat the decision of registrar court in all civil matter suits not exceeding rupees 25 in value was the final and if the decision so given was erroneous or unjust and amount exceeded rupees 25 an appeal could be moved in the provincial court of appeal and not to the mufassil diwani adalat as mentioned in the lord cornwallis plan this reduced the burden on the mufassil diwani adalat as it avoided counter signing the decrees of registrar court an additional court for deciding petty cases was also established in each of the district and three cities of patna dakka and murshidabad the collectors were vested with partial judicial powers the judge of diwani adalat was empowered to refer to the collector the revenue cases involving the adjustment accounts for scrutiny and report his report was not binding on the judges and they had complete authority to confirm set aside or alter the report this provision saved considerable time of the diwani adalat and enabled the collectors to collect land revenue without any difficulty also we can discuss about some developments that was made by sir john shore who actually improvised the changes made by him in 1794 the provision of appeal from mufansid court to the provincial court of appeal under regulation 8 plan 1794 resulted in an additional burden on the provincial courts and its routine affairs were affected he introduced changes in matters of appeals that is appeals from the decisions of the munsif court were to be taken to the mufassil diwani adalat instead of the provincial court of appeal and the decisions of diwani adalat were final in order to strengthen the control of sadar diwani adalat over the lower court a provision was made in regulation 37 of 1795 that the registrar of the mufassil diwani adalat shall maintain a register stating therein the details about the disposal of cases and those pending in the areas Another significant change introduced by regulation 37 of 1795 was the restoration of court fees to discourage superfluous and vexatious litigations. It is imperative to note that court fees were not only imposed on the prospective litigants but operated retrospectively even on those cases which were pending decisions in the low courts. Resultantly Many pending suits were dismissed for non-payment of court fees by many of the parties. The schedule of court fees was revised in 1797 when the rates of fees were increased. It decreased the number of suits in lower courts. This measure was criticized on the ground that many genuine litigants were deprived of their right to seek justice on account of their inability to deposit the court fee. on the contrary wealthy people were able to bring vexatious claims in the court as they could easily afford to pay their requisite court fees in 1795 
Sir John Shore introduced the Adalat system in the province of Banaras with the consent of Hindu Raja of Banaras, which was based on Bengal model. He enacted a set of 15 regulations. The province of Banaras was divided into four districts. A Diwani Adalat was established in each district. A provincial courts of appeal were established at Banaras, which also acted as the court of circuit for the trial of criminal offences and the courts of munsifs and the registrars were also established in the province. An appeal from this court could be preferred to the Sadar Nizamat Adalat at Calcutta. The jurisdiction of Sadar Adalat at Calcutta was also extended to Banaras so as to include it under the jurisdiction entirely. Another important attribute of the Banaras judicial scheme was that it extended certain special favours to Brahmins in matters of application of criminal law on account of their privileged position and respectable status in the society. The regulation number 16 specially provided that no Brahmin shall be punished with death sentence. In cases where an ordinary person would be sentenced to death in case of Brahmin, it shall be commuted to one of the transportation for life by the Sadar Nizamat Adalat. The court of circuit was not only empowered to pass any sentence in such a case, but it had to forward it to the Sadar Nizamat Adalat for final sentencing. Now later on, let's talk about some of the developments that were made in the year 1796. The registrars of the district Diwani Adalat and the city courts now let's discuss some of the developments made in the year 1796. The registrars of the district Diwani Adalat and the city courts were authorized to officiate as the judge of Diwani Adalat in the absence of the latter. The regulation also prescribed punishments for the evasion of the process of district magistrate and the city magistrate. The judges were required to follow the provisions of Mohammedan law of crimes only in cases where it was in favour of the accused. However, where the Mohammedan law provided for blood money, the judges were to award imprisonment even for life. The punishment of transportation beyond the seas and the branding the name of crime on the forehead of the accused was allowed and the accused charged with the perjury were severely punished. Now, another developments that were made in the year 1797. Sir John Shore tried to transform the judicial plan of 1793 by increasing the court fee further. For institution of the suit in a court of law, the parties were required to use special stamped papers. The decisions of the Provincial Court of Appeal relating to personal property valued up to rupees 5000 for, for final and in the matters above 5000 an appeal was required to be preferred to the Sadar Diwani Adalat. However, in the case of real property an appeal from the Provincial Court of Appeal could be preferred to Sadar Diwani Adalat if the value of the suit exceeded rupees 1000. If the value of the suit was rupees 5000 or more an appeal from Sadar Diwani Adalat could be moved to the King and Council within a period of six months. In order to implement some changes in the administration of justice in India, the British Parliament issued an act in 1797. The lending of money by Europeans to the native princes at higher rates brought down the image of company in front of the natives. But this practice was banned by section 28 of 1797 act and any violation of this law inflicted a heavy punishment. Another major development was that the number of judges of the Supreme Court at Calcutta was reduced to three including the Chief Justice. The act also provided about the power of local legislation in the presidency of Bengal and all regulations enacted by the Governor-General and Council at Calcutta, which also affected the natives. 
and that should be registered in the judicial department in the form of systematic codes and the provincial courts were bounded by these regulations. In order to reduce the burden of Diwani Adalat, he reduced the power of appeal from lower to higher courts. Reintroducing the court fees also helped him to reduce the number of cases in Diwani Adalat by discouraging frivolous litigations. He expanded the Adalat system into the provinces. He also ensured the security of the lives and property of the residents of the province of Banaras. Now, let's come to the conclusion of the topic. The critical evaluation of the 1793 Cornwallis Code and the development of the Adalat system under Sir John Shore illuminated the important changes and difficulties encountered by the Indian judiciary in the 18th century when it was governed by the British East India Company. The 1793 Cornwallis Code, authored by Lord Cornwallis, instituted several reforms such as the abolition of court costs, the division of civil and revenue jurisdiction, the restructuring of the police service and the establishment of a permanent land revenue settlement in India. These adjustments were to be made to increase the fairness, accessibility and effectiveness of the entire legal system. Several issues persisted despite these adjustments such as the collectors abuse of their power, the backlog in the court system and the focus on tax collection. However, by enacting these measures to ease the load on the courts, give the registrars more authority and accordingly expedited the appeals process, Sir John Shore proceeded to improve the legal system. Under Shore's leadership, the Adalat system developed, bringing about a significant advancement in the judicial oversight of executive acts as well as the creation of more autonomous as well as effective civil court systems in India. Overall, it can be very well stated that the efforts to enhance the administration of civil justice in India were reflected in the Cornwallis Code of 1793 and the developments that followed under Sir John Shaw's leadership. These efforts emphasized the significance of the rule of law, separation of powers and the accessibility to justice in the colonial governance. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. We have discussed the entire concept in a very short time and I hope that all the listeners have understood the topic. Stay safe, stay healthy, God bless you all, take care.